Hello out there! It's time for the Hockey Minute, your source for all of today's hockey news with some opinion. Strap in for the fastest news in the NHL. This episode is proudly brought to you by fucking nobody. We don't have any sponsors. Now, here's your hosts, Brandon and Ryan. And here we are. I am your host, Brandon, and with me, as always, my co-host, Ryan. How you doing, man? I'm doing well. It's, it's a nice day out. I went for a little bit of a walk, uh, kept my social distancing, but, uh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, how about you? Uh, about pretty much the same, man. It's, uh, it's wild out there. I feel like I'm going through 28 days later, but uh, the commute <laughs> to work has been pretty unreal. Yeah, yeah. Cheap gas out this way, too. It's nice. Oh, it's beautiful. All right, well, today we're going to be starting uh, part one of a multi-part series where we dig into each NHL team, get a feeling for how their season went, how their team is trending, and uh, how well do we expect them to do going forward. And today we're going to be starting uh, in the Pacific Division with the Edmonton Oilers. And I I think it's pretty safe to say that uh, Edmonton was expected to be a a bubble team, uh, at least at at the beginning of the year. Um, How were you feeling about them? Yeah, I, I would agree with that. Like, I don't... I guess it was kind of the, the fool me once, uh, you know, shame on you, fool me twice and and uh, <laughs> shame on me. But you know what? They they came out and, and I think that uh, it was a combination of maybe frustration uh, with those guys to just not, not make the playoffs. Um, as well as, I mean, let's be honest, the Pacific Division was, it was just kind of chaos this year. There wasn't really a front runner, so... Um, so yeah, I think Edmonton exceeded any expectations that were laid out. Uh, I don't know. Who were some of the bright spots for you? I mean, it's, it's hard to look past Leon Dreisaitl. 110 points in what, 71 games. Never went uh, three games without a point except for the final three games. Uh, he'd score with or without McDavid. He finally was able to drive his own line with Kyler Yamamoto and, and, and Nuge. I mean, uh, it's... There's only a couple bright spots, honestly, for Edmonton as far as, as I'm concerned. And the other one is, is obvious. It's, it's Connor McDavid. Uh, 97 points in, in 64 games. Um, maybe you could mention Mike Smith in there. Uh, but, I mean, can you expect him to repeat that next year with his age going forward? I mean, really, it's, it's just those, those two centers from, from my eyes anyway. How about you? Yeah, I would toss Yamamoto in there too. I mean, he's he's a difference maker, not in the sense that he's come and, and lit the you know lit the world on fire, but he's given that that secondary scoring right that allowed Drysaitel to drop down into the two center, and uh, and Yamamoto. I mean, he just he's he's scrappy too. I mean, for a smaller guy, watching some right. of those Oiler games, he was in the corner, he's fighting to get pucks out, and he's the one that's doing all that work down low to get the puck to uh to make da- or sorry to dry sidle or, or to nugent hopkins as well um right you know i mean yamamoto i think he had 26 points in 27 games and right that's right. A, a case of a young kid that's coming in and, and they did a good job with his development too there was no rushing him into the nhl like they've done in the past uh so i think they handled him pretty well and i think he's going to be a player yeah, and isn't that? It's kind of funny to note that that finally they they let somebody marinate for the right amount of time in the minors. Like, how many first overall picks have they sullied, or you know, come close to sullying in in the course of time? And now they've got a kind of a B prospect that they've managed to turn into almost an A one just uh, through some pro- promising development. It's uh, it's neat to see. A hundred percent, and you know this team they're going in the right direction. It's about time, and I think that hockey, the world, uh, wants to see McDavid battle it out in the playoffs and uh these guys are right where they need to be i think yeah i mean i i think you're right there i think the only thing they need is seasoning in the playoffs and the only way that comes is in the playoffs so there's there's no way to know how well they're going to be or how competitive they can actually be until they take a run at it um i have a bit of a feeling it's it's going to take a couple of uh a couple of playoff seasons for them to really get their legs under them and, and make a run at it but uh i know one of our, our writers on the staff believes that they, they could have been a dark horse pick for the cup uh, I think that's a bit crazy, a bit too rich for me. But uh, I think they, with how weak the Pacific Division is, I mean, I think that the Pacific Division was all within, I think, two or three points, um, close to to Christmas time in the All Star break. So it, it it was anybody's anybody's division to win. And I think Edmonton probably could have made it to the conference finals, but past that, I think they would have got smoked by, uh, I mean, just about anybody who made it. Yeah, we'll never know. Thanks a lot, coronavirus. <laughs> 
Um, so going forward for for next season, what what, what do you think uh, Edmonton is looking like? Do you see any any weak points, any uh, any any points of strength, areas they need to shore up? Well, you touched on it, right? Mike Smith. I mean, is he going to be the Mike Smith from the 2012 Coyotes, or is he going to be the Mike Smith that we've seen the last couple of years? You know, inconsistent. Um, and then, I mean, their goaltending nowadays you need two goalies, and and Miko Koskinen. And I don't know if he's a legit, <laughs> so, you know, a legitimate goalie. Uh, some nights he mm-hmm. looks good, and and uh, as I think anyone will tell you, you look at that team. They they run on offense. They run on ninety seven. They run on dry sidle. They run on you know Nugent Hopkins for secondary scoring. So defensively, as much as I like Darnell Nurse and Oscar Clefbaum, I mean beyond those two guys. You know, Ethan Bear looks promising, but I just don't think yep. that they're. I don't. I don't think their blue line is strong enough to really make a splash. Yeah, you're right. Actually, I think I think Matt Benning is probably a little bit underrated on on, on their back end. Um, but yeah, there's there's no real number one D, at least in, in in my opinion. I mean, they have Oscar Clefbaum, who's probably a three four on any other team. Um, same with Darnell Nurse. Um, still a bit too many lapses defensively. I mean. I don't know. I'm just uh, I'm not fully sold on their back end. I think that they've been playing a much better team game this year, though, and I, I think that they can probably carry that forward uh, just on the strength of their forwards, much in the same way that Pittsburgh has done for the last oh what twelve years. <laughs> yeah, it's just, hey, if it works, it works. But I just don't. Uh, yeah. You know, Pittsburgh also had Flurry and Murray and Smith and Koskinen aren't that uh, that level in my opinion. But I mean, yeah, there's nowhere to go but up for them. Absolutely. I think that's going to do it for us on the Edmonton Oilers. And next up, the Arizona Coyotes. And, you know, they're they're kind of an interesting team in that most people expected them to be uh, an absolute bubble team, if if not out of the playoffs. And they, uh, man, they absolutely made some moves. They they managed to, to be a bubble team, uh, despite anybody's expectations. Uh, how did you see them going into the year? Well, I, I think I saw them as a rebuilding team myself, but John Chaka did... I wouldn't say a good job, but I think he made some bold moves. And he got Phil Kessel in the offseason. Um, in December, he trades for Taylor Hall. Uh, so I think that he's doing the best that he can, but they lost a lot of man games this year. And um, mm-hmm. so, I, I mean, I still kind of I still kind of consider them a rebuilding team because we don't know what's going to happen with Taylor Hall. And uh, the rest of the team I don't think is good enough to really uh, really make some noise. Yeah, do, do they really have anybody coming up? I mean, they have Connor Garland, who I, I know Biz on uh, Spit and Chicklets always pumps his tires of as being the best kind of value deal in the NHL. But uh, there's just not a whole lot there that's coming up. And I mean, the way that uh, Cheka handled this year, it really felt like he wanted them to be a contender, and he, he saw them that way, right? He brings in Kessel, like you mentioned, the the Taylor Hall trade, which was ballsy for sure, but. I mean, even if this Corona stuff hadn't happened, I I, I didn't think the Coyotes were going to make the playoffs at all. I felt like they were falling out. So, I mean, how do you rate his uh, kind of his performance over this past season? Well, with Cheka, he's I mean, I, I, he's been there a few years, and I feel like now is the time where yeah. those guys, you know, if you're front office, if you're a coach, if you've been there a few years, then you need to see results and you need to, you know, otherwise you're potentially losing your job. So he's doing what he can. But the interesting thing was that before they got Taylor Hall, they were 19, 16 and four. And after they get Taylor Hall, they go 14, 21 and four. So right. like, is that on Cheka? I don't think so. I think that that Taylor Hall trade was a pretty good deal for them, but the player they got just, you know, whatever they thought was going to happen didn't happen. Yeah, and I just I don't think Taylor Hall, I don't think his performance ever matches his perceived value, right? Like he just he always underperforms what people expect out of him. Yeah, if he um, if he I don't know if that's necessarily fair, but well, I, but the thing is, I I would agree with that. I mean, if he's your number one option, I don't think you're going to win. I don't think you're going to be a contender. Yeah. If if he's your second or your third option, then yeah, you're you're going to do pretty good, right? But. They brought him in, and they were talking about him being potentially the the best Arizona Coyote or the most hyped up Coyote because he's got that hard trophy. Um, <laughs> I don't know, man. I mean, we don't need to get into it on this episode, but that hard trophy to me should have gone to Nathan McKinnon, anyways. And, uh, right. and Taylor Hall, he's never been able to really replicate that. And yeah, he's injury prone, but 
to me, I just don't think he's he's a, a game breaker. But uh, no, I I totally agree. Yeah, but I mean, there were some bright spots, and and I I know I have a couple. But did you have any bright spots you wanted to talk about for for the Yotes? Yeah, I mean, I think most people will will talk about uh, guys like uh, Jacob Chikrin, um, Alex Goligoski were a, a really good tandem, like a, providing a nice one-two on the back end, and they actually do have a good defensive core. Uh, I think probably a little bit underappreciated and. Uh, you know, just for playing where they play, their eight fans aren't going to get the word out that well. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, Rick Rick Tockett, their their coach, I think he's done an, an outstanding job. And uh, uh, I mean, well, one of the things I, I kind of find interesting about their team this year is is uh, Phil Kessel has a, a relationship with Rick Tockett from previous teams, and uh, it, I mean, I think that might have been one of the main reasons they brought in Phil Kessel is because they expected them to have a good working relationship. And Phil Kessel obviously has a bit of a reputation as, uh, you know, kind of doing his own thing. And they expected Taka to be able to get the most out of him. But what did Kessel end up with this year for on, in, in terms of scoring, right? I think he has something like 16 goals or 18 goals. Yeah. No, I think he's checked out. I think he got his two cups. He's He's got his money. Yeah. Um, he did what every person that thinks about retiring does. He went to Arizona. And I don't see him... You know, if we talk about Taylor Hall not being a game breaker, I don't see Phil. Phil was never, I think, a, a number one guy either. We saw that with Toronto. Um, no, he went exactly. to Pittsburgh. He played with elite centermen there, and and obviously that helped. Uh, you know, he helped them win definitely. But yeah, I I just think that that team now they're they're getting. You know, their offense. I mean, they were twenty first in the league in goals, and you know, Nick Schmaltz was their leader with 45 points. Like that's not good enough <laughs> at this point in the year. No. You know, if you've got a guy that's not even close to a point per game, your, your team's not going to win that way. Right. I mean, they basically have a team of third liners with a couple of like elite second line scoring, right? Like I don't even know if Taylor Hall is a, like a legit top line winger most of the time. No. Like he's just, I don't know. Yeah. Um, all right, so how do you see them moving forward? Like, what what do you think their next year is going to look like? Any any areas they're going to need to shore up? Uh, how do you how do you see it going? Uh, it's hard to say because I, I think it hinges on Taylor Hall, and I don't know if he's going to resign. I mean, obviously, in this we're in kind of a downtime right now, but I haven't heard anything. I've heard Chaco wants to discuss, uh, you know, a, a potential resigning, but who knows what Hall wants, right? I mean, he's got his money. Does he want to win or does he? maybe resign to the fact that he's more likely to get your team a first overall pick than a cup. And maybe, maybe he likes it in Arizona. Um, so I don't see them. Uh, I see them as a rebuilding team next year for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And with kind of an interesting point with, with Taylor Hall is like, I mean, I, you, you mentioned that he's made his money, but I wonder if he thinks that, I mean, he, I think he signed six by six out of his, his entry and, yeah you know he's probably thinking he's worth eight and a half or nine i mean i wouldn't agree but i imagine that's what he's thinking and so it, somebody's going to pay that is he going to go to the rangers is he going to go to columbus i mean there's lots of teams that need scoring and they're going to make great offers and i just I, I don't see the coyotes ever being a cap team so no. I, I mean i don't think they're ever going to make an offer that he's going to think is is his full value and so is he going to want to take a discount to play on a rebuilding team in a market where nobody gives a shit yeah yeah and that's exactly it so i don't know regardless if he signs or not i don't think it changes arizona just not being a contender with some of the other teams in their division getting better either so that's going to do it for us for the arizona coyotes and next uh, we're going to move on to the calgary flames and i think that uh, everybody looked at calgary this year as a bubble team i think uh, just like the other teams in the pacific they realized what a kind of weak division it was going to be but uh, coming off a, a Norris year for, for Giordano, uh, Matt Kachuk getting better, uh, Monaghan and, and Goudreau having, supposed to be having good seasons, I think that most people would have considered them kind of a wild card or 2-3 in, in the, the division. Uh, how did you see it? Yeah, I, I didn't think they'd really make a lot of noise, to be honest. I mean, they, they made a, a lateral move. They traded James Neal to get Milan Lucic. And Brad Tree mm-hmm. Living said all the right things about that deal, saying this was going to amplifier toughness well they've got a team with Kachuk and Sam Bennett and Travis Hamanick um you know I think that I think they're right on course like I, I don't I don't think they failed this year but I don't think they really exceeded any expectations I think they're right where a lot of people expected them to be and 
Um, the one thing I will say, though, they got some bright spots with, with Kachuk and, and Lindholm, and I think that's overtaken Goudreau and Monaghan as their uh, their two best forwards. Yeah, I, I think that's that's absolutely true. I mean, um, I don't know exactly what the fan sentiment is in Calgary towards Goudreau and Monaghan, but after the just poor seasons that they had, I just I, I can't imagine most people think of them as their, their one-two punch there anymore. They must be looking towards Kachuk as the next captain. Yeah, and I mean he's he does everything, and I, you know people know him more so as the guy that has pissed off Drew Doughty, has has made Zach Cassian, you know, go nuts. But he still had sixty one points this year, and he had some highlight reel goals with that. Um, and he does everything. And you know what? We want you talk about offensive production. I mean, Johnny Gaudreau, yeah, he's known as an offensive player, but he's one dimensional. And Kachuk is still out there. He's still you know in the corner banging around. He's you know. He does all those things that Goodrow won't, and he has similar production. So, um, I mean, I don't know. Goodrow was a, a total dud this year, and maybe because of what happened with Bill Peters and all those allegations that led to Bill Peters being let go or resigning or, you know, however, <laughs> you know, maybe asked to leave. I don't know. But uh, Right. You, you, you can't fire me if I quit. Yeah, right. It's just maybe you let him save some face. But that obviously that's a distraction on that team for sure and we can't we can't discredit that but at the same time you expect Johnny Gaudreau who you're paying you know a decent uh, amount to and and I mean a couple of years ago was considered a heart trophy candidate uh, not, I think mm-hmm. he had 93 points like he, you need more out of your your best player or a guy that is supposedly your best player and I just don't think he's there anymore and I don't know if if it's just a matter of he just doesn't care yeah I mean it's it's hard to kind of impugn a guy's heart when when it comes to to hockey or or just any sport but it's it's hard to watch Johnny Hockey and and think that guy gives a shit like it's just it's it's just that simple and sure the 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 coach may have had a a factor in it and it's it's hard to discount that but I mean he's still a pro being paid good money to perform and the end of the day he didn't and so I, I would not be surprised at all to see him playing in Philly, uh, which is obviously his hometown uh, when he's a UFA, or just any, anywhere else. I mean, lots of teams would go out of the way to get him because, I mean, let's be honest, there, there's never been an era in hockey that was more suited to his game than today's game. But uh, he's not he's not flourishing in the way that, that he should be. No, that's exactly it. Where do you see them next year? Do you think they're uh, a playoff team? I actually do think they'll be a playoff team, and I, I know that. Uh, I mean, that may surprise some people, considering they're essentially going to be the same team, but maybe a, a, a little bit worse. But I just, I, I, Sean Monahan's too good of a player to to not bounce back. Johnny Goudreau is going to have some semblance of a bounce back season. I mean, he's, he's not going to put up the the pitiful numbers that he put up. Um, Michael Backlund is probably going to be the number one C next season, and he's he's an unreal, underrated player, just a, a defensive stalwart. He's a, a selkie candidate going forward, I think. Like he's he's a, a phenomenal player. Um, so I, I wouldn't be surprised at all to see them kind of the wild card or the, maybe the two or three spot even in in the Pacific, um, as as long as they can kind of keep uh, keep trending somewhat in 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 a positive direction. Yeah, I mean, I'm not sure I agree with you on it, but I've trashed them enough, so. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, that's going to do it for us for the Calgary Flames. And uh, next up, we're moving on to the Vegas Golden Knights. And uh, at least from my perspective, Vegas is a team that I had earmarked for the top of the Pacific. I mean, their defense is slowing down a little bit, but they are still a fast, aggressive team and one of the only teams in the league that I think truly has a, a home ice advantage still. Um, how did you see them going into the year, Ryan? Yeah, I, th- I thought they would be the best team in the Pacific. Uh, they've they've turned it around. They were the team of misfits in year one, and then they went out, they got Mark Stone, they got Max Pacioretty, they signed those guys to, uh, to extensions. Um, Shea Theodore is a very good defenseman, doesn't get nearly enough credit. Uh, so, yeah, I, I, I think they had uh, a year of, of meeting expectations. I mean... It was kind of a weird year for them because they get rid of Gallant, who is a very good coach and was very well liked. And then they went out and they got the the probably the first real rival uh, coach right. from from the or the coach from their first real rival. And uh, you know it turned things around for them a little bit. But 
the offense remained relatively the same uh, between the two coaches, but their defense got way better with uh, with DeBoer at the helm. Right, but I, I think one thing that kind of gets discounted uh, about uh, Gallant getting fired and, and the disparity of, of records between the two coaches is that their goaltending was pretty much garbage through the first half of the year. And what are you supposed to do when your goalie's not playing? Like, you just... You can blame the coach and you can fire him, but they got better goaltending once once uh, once he was fired. It, 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 I don't think that's necessarily the coach's doing. I just think that's uh, circumstantial. I, I think they have a very, very aggressive management team there, though, probably starting from the ownership down and not a whole lot of patience. No, and it, that's, uh, that's exactly what it is. I think that's what killed Gallant is that they exceeded expectations in, in their first yep. year. And they're trying to just keep that wave going, especially because you've got the NFL going uh, to Vegas as well. And um, I'm sure the NBA's probably looked at expanding into Vegas as well. But right now, that's the only team. So they want to, you know, they want to have that success right now. Um, I mean, there's a few bright spots for, for Vegas as well. I mean, aside from the team play, but Max Pacioretty, uh, you know, had 32 goals, 66 points. Um probably their first real superstar would you say i mean mark stone's there too yeah i mean i i have a personal like deep affection for mark stone i just i love the way he plays he skates like trash which reminds me of me <laughs> so it's just i don't know I, I to me personally i think mark stone does more that wows me i think Pacioretty is just a wonderful finisher obviously he's got that shot um he's got a bigger body that he's he's okay to get into traffic but um, yeah, you're, you're, you're probably right. Like the casual fan in Vegas probably identifies with Pacioretty much more than, than Mark Stone. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's partly, a, he's a, he's the American. He's just the, just a handsome guy. You know, Mark Stone looks like he fell off the ugly tree, hit every branch on the way down too. Oh buddy. I, that, yeah, that'll, that'll do yeah, it. It's, it's a good thing. He's a pro athlete. <laughs> Um, yeah, with this team, I mean, there weren't really any, any weak spots either. Like, you know, you could maybe make it a a case Cody Glass wasn't ready, but that's, that's their first draft pick. He's going to get every chance to, to make some noise and, uh, he's only going to get better too. I mean, he's going to be sheltered with some of that offense. Paul Stasny's there too, up the middle for them. So, um, yeah, you know, I, I think it's only a matter of time. Vegas is going to be, I think a contender for the next few years. It's almost enough to make you puke really. Oh, like I it, it just it fucking no, oh, it's brutal. <laughs> uh, one, one one thing I, I was thinking about Cody Glass is is it wouldn't surprise me at all to see him moved in the off season, and it's it, it's not because he had a disappointing season. It's just because Vegas is absolutely in a win now mode, and uh, it wouldn't surprise me at all to see them try and gain a, a piece that helps in the next year, maybe a, a good mobile defenseman, something. Right? They're they're getting a little bit slower on the back end. They are going to need to speed up there. So uh, I, I wouldn't be shocked to see Glass on the move. Yeah, their top six is solidified. They got Riley Smith and Marcheseau and Carlson in their, their second line. So, yeah, I, I think that makes sense. You don't want to bury a kid on the on the third line when he's a top 10 pick. So yeah, I would agree with that. So how would you grade their, their overall season then? Would you say uh, kind of they, they met expectations or would you say they exceeded them? Yeah, I think they met expectations, maybe exceeded a little bit. Um, And moving forward, I don't see, aside from what you just said about Cody Glass, maybe moved for another piece. Um, They're built pretty good. I mean, you look at even their fourth line. They got Reeves. They got, uh, I think, Kerry. I don't know if he got traded at the deadline. But, um, you know, their fourth line's tough. They got good defensemen that are mobile. Um, And, yeah, I mean, I just think from top to bottom, it's just a well-rounded team. So it wouldn't surprise me at all if, if they've just become a stalwart in the pacific yeah and, and didn't they they pick up uh oh man i'm drawing a blank on his name now the goaltender from chicago laner yeah exactly and and it seems like he could even take over as the number one for flurry uh he's he's kind of got the mentality for it i'm surprised at how many teams seem to be i don't know if, if disrespecting is the right word but it kind of feels like it towards uh towards laner just because of his um, admitted struggles with some some mental health stuff uh, feels like that was enough of a black flag for or red, red flag for teams that they uh, they're passing on him. Yeah, but you know what? You're right. I mean, they traded uh, Subban right and to get Laner, and so Flurry's yeah. not getting younger. And I think he's uh, I think this is the first year of his deal, so he's got two more after this. And uh, it wouldn't you know mm-hmm. Leonard I think is on an expiring contract, so I mean he might as well just hey three, four years um, at, a, at a decent price, and 
their you know your goaltending is uh, is solved. Yeah, he's a he seems like an absolute bargain, and uh, I'm actually a little bit bitter that that Vegas got him. <laughs> um, <laughs> So that, that's going to do it for us for the uh, Vegas Golden Knights. And that's actually going to wrap up our first half of our Pacific Division breakdown. So from Brandon and Ryan, we'll catch you next time on the Hockey Minute. We'd like to take a second and thank you, the listener, for joining us. And a big thanks goes to our writers and production team, Jules, Mark, and Matt. We couldn't do this without you. That's going to do it for us. This is Brandon and Ryan. We'll talk to you next time on the Hockey Minute.